cover and, and we tended to try to cover it all. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I uh, think a preacher can make. Uh, but I'd like to preach today and for us to consider Hebrews 10, which kind of comes at the end if you've been following along in the scripture reading schedule. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to take a little time to kind of summarize. Um, Hebrews 10 reminds us that reminders are good. And I can recall the days when I would go to church or to a Bible study or to any Christian meeting where a sermon was going to be delivered. And whether I was really desiring to hear God's word or not, I would often walk away judging the value of that experience of what I had heard based on whether I had heard something new. And I think that's an instinct that I still have and I need to guard myself against. And that's something I believe that many Christians fall prey to is that suspense, am I going to hear something that I've never heard before? Am I going to hear it in a way that will finally change my life? And we're caught up in this idea that Christianity or the Christian experience of spirituality are wrapped up into moments, and certainly they are part of the whole ball of wax. But it's so much greater than that. And one of the toughest things as a preacher is, and I've said this before, one of the greatest things sad is after a sermon someone tells you that was a great sermon and they haven't applied any of it it just I guess they were awake and it was enlightening or entertaining whatever it may be but one of the toughest moments and again this speaks to the frailty of uh, pastors you know is when someone comes up to you especially right after you give a sermon let's say it's John 3.16 and someone comes up to you and says, oh, thank you for the message. You know, when I heard Tim Keller preach that, he really made me understand. And I've had that happen all the time. <coughs> you how sure I am. But I walk away with one with a bruised, frail ego. But secondly, I'm a little sad because, and I do this as well, so I don't want to just, uh, if that's you, I don't want to say that that you would not mean it is me too. But I think that limits and uh, it limits the way God really works. It limits our understanding. And we shortchange how God is faithful in so many different ways. For example, today you consider Father. And I can recall the days where I absolutely hated my dad. Because he was just so strong. Not let me watch TV. So I would pretend like I was getting a snack and turn on the TV just for five minutes. And then he would say, What's taking so long? And then I shut off and go back up and pretend like I was seven. And I hate him. And then I would just be upset at the fact that he tried to protect me from certain worldly influences. And honestly, I look back and now as a father, I look back and I can't get my dad or any lighter in his discipline. I think I would get utterly lost. And some of the guys who know me from my high school days would probably say a triple amen to that. But I look back and I think, I have no idea what he was doing. And I still never will know all the things that he has done for me. And I only focus on the moment. And God today is going to maybe give you just a reminder of something that you may know so well. But sometimes if you're like me, you're an old dog that needs to be harassed over and over and over again. <coughs> reminded over and over and over again. And every reminder is a reflection of that person's faithfulness and diligence perseverance and patience to do that. So even as I looked over this in preparation, 
it was a great reminder to me. And there was always that lingering temptation in my mind and heart to say, I know this. I don't even know if I need to prepare it. I'll just whip together a message and just sound polished and just don't say any ums or likes and don't think I'm prepared well. But it was a great reminder to the, in the many different aspects and facets of my own life. And was uh, graciously uh, told by the Lord that it's so needed, so applicable. So if today is a reminder to you, I hope you will receive it well. And, and trust that God uses everything, even the down times, even the falters that uh, we experience. He uses all of that to accomplish his purposes. But let's read from Hebrews chapter 10. And even though we uh, originally told we'll read the whole chapter, we're going to read up to 25 and then pick God at 35 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form, of these realities, we can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, be perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been, uh, once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will. As it is written of me in the scroll of the book, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who comes is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And skipping over to verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. 
sacred prayer. Father, thank you for your word and your blessing to our hearts and souls. To your glory and honor. If you look really quick and you have your Bibles open, I'd like to begin by looking at verse 22, which is briefly, we we'll turn back to it circle back around. It says to have full assurance of faith. 23. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. 24. Consider how to stir up one another to love good deeds. 25. Don't neglect meeting together as is this habit of many perhaps, encourage one another as we see the day approaching. Maybe none of those describe you at And no, don't worry, I'm not here to say that that's true. I'm not looking towards the end. I'm thinking of June 26, when we will pack our bags and head down to Annapolis and drop off our son. I'm not thinking of Jesus returning. The 26 may not even come. I'm thinking of dropping off my son and now I will have two. And he's gone. That's it. Because even after he graduates, if he gets to complete his studies at Annapolis, he goes right onto a ship and he sails off. He's gone. I'm not thinking of Jesus returning. I'm thinking about going back to school tomorrow and throwing away all those papers I forgot to return to my students. And dusting off shelves that... I'm thinking about, am I going to teach this class again? Am I going to teach a different class? Uh, some teachers have left, and how are we going to handle that? I'm not thinking of that thing. I'm thinking about the times when I say to my wife, no, I don't feel like going. Do I go? Even though know, I have to my mistake. I'm thinking about that time where that kid needs Jesus, but someone else needs to tell him. Not me. I don't have time for that. I don't have the patience. Or my wife and I, we cast lots. Not me, but we cast lots. Who's going to talk to our child who is just not in a bad mood and wreaking havoc and, and causing a lot of pain and suffering to our souls in that moment? Who is it? You talk to me. You talk to me. I actually don't talk to me. But there are many, many more times that I don't feel like doing any of these things. In fact, I feel like the complete opposite, the negative of, these, of this list describes my own. And maybe that's you as well. All the more that impresses upon me the need for, and it's helpful if you look at your Bible, to have that full assurance. And the great thing about the gospel and what Jesus promises us through his word is that you can have assurance. You can. Will it waver? It certainly will. Because what the Bible does not promise is that you will live a perfect life on this side of eternity. You will waver. But you will, and it can grow, and it it, its duration can extend. You can enjoy assurance. And we love assurance. Because even in the most enjoyable circumstances or things in our lives, they don't give us ultimate assurance. All good things come to an end. In fact, if I were to think, what is the one thing that gives the greatest assurance? It is the most negative thing, which is death. It's only nothing left you can do about it. But parenting, I thought it was pretty good, and that's come to an end pretty much to some degree. He's gone. That we look at the pictures and the, the cuteness and the times watching him play basketball and, and him learning new things and developing and maturing. I don't get to see that really in the one to 18 year, first 18 year sense. You know, we think of marriage. I think of Tim Rowe and how I look back at great years and remember the thrill of finding out our child was a boy. We waited for our first. Second, third, it doesn't matter. And don't worry, I know what that's like if I was a second. 
<laughs> but the first child, you know, you, you invest so much, and the second, third, they get leftovers and handing downs and all this stuff. But we waited for nine months to find out, is it Ben or is it, I don't know. And I was just hoping it would be a boy. I didn't have a girl's name picked up. Great years. Came to an end. Now we're all. Now we're thinking grandparents. I had, uh, I got married at 25, that's early, yes. I realized that if my son comes home in seven years, oh my gosh, seven years and he says I'm getting married, I would say, why don't we take a little time to pray and think about this, but it's right on the corner. All good things come to an end. But God in the gospel of Jesus Christ promises perfect assurance. You can have full confidence. That's why everything that he has written, wherever this writer is, and it doesn't really matter, and that's a separate discussion, and people get really overwhelmed or they get thrown off by the fact that we don't really know for certain who the writer is, but again, that's okay. The first nine chapters uh, provide us all the material, all the substance and essence that compel us to see that the gospel gives us certainty. The certainty that it gives us is amazing. And maybe for some of you, the lacklusterness of your faith or the weakness and the strength of your faith is due to the fact that you're not really certain or you don't really know what it is God has given you. Give you so much, immeasurable, priceless, one of a kind. And we can, we can think of God's love and our Father's love and kind of put them on equal playing fields today, but there really is no comparison. And that's not in any way to shame who I am or who I could be to my children or my father and what he was and what he still is to me or can be in the coming days and years. God is incomparable, incomprehensible to a certain degree. And wonderfully, he has revealed himself so that we can begin to understand and know who he is and to enjoy him. And from that, even in, in, chapter, in chapter 4, God offers this thing called rest. And we know, very, we know a limited amount from Scripture as to what that rest really means. The first introduction we're given is in Genesis, where on the on the seventh day, God rested from his work. And rest is in retirement. Because I don't know, I meet a lot of retired people and they're not very happy. A lot of those folks who are retired and they spent 40, 50 years working, they want to go back. So much so, they're willing to take that 9 to 5 minimum wage paying job just to get out of the house. Retirement means, oh my gosh, I got to spend more hours on this stuff. It's not retirement. It's not like, and I used to think this, and maybe you did too. You mean in heaven we're just going to be sitting in pews and singing songs and listening to a sermon for eternity? I'm here to tell you no. Now there will be lots of singing. I think there's so much more that we'll be doing. It's just that everything we'll be doing will be glorifying God. I don't think we're just going to be sitting there and absorbing words. We're going to be living them, hearing them, expressing them, feeling them, thinking them forever. And it will be beyond your greatest Christian experience. That rest where there is wholeness and peace. Because even if you find yourself, let's say, financially stable today, you may ask yourself, do I have enough to retire? Do I have enough to retire and to give to my kids? There's that anxiety, that stress, that uncertainty, that lack of assurance, whatever it may be. And maybe your own personal experience has attested to the truth that even when things get good, you never know what's right around the corner. In fact, sometimes I like to think, in my simple, egotistical way, I am the unluckiest person facing the earth. And I think I'm almost there to convince my life that it's true. And whenever something good seems to happen, something really bad follows. 
So we, we have this really warped sense of assurance and confidence. But maybe you're in a relationship where their parenting was great when they're two, aside from the diapers and aside from the feedings and, and the ear infections. And I was making fun of my son because he had an ear infection. And he's 18, and I looked at him and I said, you're going in the military? And I said, who gets an ear infection after the age of two? So you look back at two, and maybe it was great until two, and then the terribleness comes in. But until two, they're beautiful, and they're cuddly, and they don't smell, and, and they just kind of make strange, wonderful noises, and all this good stuff, and the pictures look great. And they can't complain, you just strap them in and drive away. They eat what you give when they spit it out. It's like it's really safe. But the gospel offers something that is good, continues to be good. In fact, that we get better. That you won't reflect on your Christian understanding of what <coughs> God promises based on your personal human experiences. Looking at an 18 year old and say, oh, they're just not that cute anymore. They or my kids give me the attitude. Don't be a parent. Or don't get married. It's not that great. And we get really cynical. And we project that out to God when God wants to give us hope, even if this wasn't directly in the purview of application. But we look at God to apply it even to the areas of our lives where they can be redeemed and restored and made better. We can begin to enjoy that rest even in this lifetime. And that is all because of Christ. And if you're not someone who is fully sold, again, it sounds really good. It sounds yeah, very church. But I have nothing else to offer. And I don't know what else I would want from God except for, except for God to give himself. And that's the gospel of God saying, I'm going to give you myself. I'm going to give you my son who is myself. And that's what we see in chapter 1. Jesus is not an example. Jesus is God. And that's what God offers. In fact, if you think you believe in Christianity, but that's where you deviate from me, and you think, well, Jesus is just a great example, like so many others, or maybe even ten times better, even if you were to say a thousand times better, I would say you're not believing in what God's offering. God is saying, I'm giving you me. And to take it a step further, the writer of Hebrews says, it's not only that God is saying, I'm giving you me, and I want you to just look at him and say, wow, you are a wonderful example. So on Friday morning, we had a senior brunch at our school, and my son said some great things, some of them lies about me, um, and he said, you're a wonderful example. I mean, that's great. That's the best I can be. But the writer of Hebrews says, beyond that, what God is actually doing and offers and does is he not only offers himself, but you receive God. You don't just, wow, now I have something to look at. I have some measure to, um, to compare my life against and to realign myself with. He says, you receive me. And that's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is. We receive the Holy Spirit within us. And that's affirmed elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 1. See, this thing is amazing. It's so much bigger than I thought. So much bigger than even what um, someone with years of theological education can conceive. Now don't get me wrong, just because my knowledge is limited, I believe I know the gospel, but there's so much more. The fact that I do believe that for eternity, you will learn more and more and more and more and more. Like you ever meet that person who so loves their discipline? You mean like a physicist. They start talking about stuff. Because that's all it is. And they get so wrapped up, and, and I'll just walk away and say, wow, that was really weird. Or mathematician, and whatever goes off about me. Math. It's funny, the other day my dad said, I didn't know you could get a PhD in computer science. He, he just didn't know there was that much to know. And he was kind of, he just giggled about it. But even when I go off about theology, people will be like, that's nice. 
But for God, there's so much more out there. And here's the great thing. When we get to that place of rest where rest is everything at all the time, every bit that we learn more and more, you will actually enjoy it. You will never find yourself in a moment where you say, okay, that's nice. You will be blown away. And so we should change God in so many ways. And what the writer of Hebrews is trying to do is he wants to convey to you that God is beyond our comprehension that big. What we can imagine. And he uses words like promise. Every single promise in here. Now, I'm joking. My Bible, some of you who are here for the first time, my Bible has about 2,500 pages. Only because I'm blind and it's the font and size 17. But take any promise. God says, I don't know about you. I can take one promise. I don't know if you took me seriously, but I've mentioned on several occasions that for three years straight recently, my devotion was only Ephesians, I'm sorry, Philippians 4.16. For three years. I couldn't go beyond that. Because it just kept reminding me, and even there were moments where I would go repeatedly back to it, and I would see something new, something greater. My appreciation, love, and understanding of God in the world. Maybe for you, it's uh, the plethora of assurances in Isaiah that says, God will never forsake you. Run. All of those promises, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, they are yes and amen only in Jesus. You cannot claim them unless you have received them. Somewhere. But the great thing again, that's not to upset you, I say God is offering that to you. He is leaving that right there at your foot, at your footstep, at your doorstep, right there for you to see. And you as you forever. That's what God gives all these promises, all these assurances. And what the writer of Hebrews is then saying is, you gotta know me. And you've got to trust in the Lord and, and let that faith grow and dive deeper and deeper into this faith. And the avenue through which you do that is His Word. Where you receive more and more of His grace, your eyes are made wider and wider to who He is, what He has done, not only in history, that the stories of Moses aren't just historical, biblical stories from vacation Bible school, but they are personal stories from and then your eyes were wider and wider, and you receive more and more of that light of Christ. And then you can get to assurance. And he gives several warnings in the first nine chapters, and this may be a bit crass, and so since Pastor Steve did it last week, I'll do it, you can edit this part out. But our family lived in Scotland for four years, and so we had, um, we, we lived in a flat where we weren't allowed to get cable, so we used the Ravagers. And we barely got any channels, but there was one channel we got, and we came across this show, and it was kind of like a Saturday Night Live. And you need to know that the Brits are a bit more crass about it, just it sounds better, so it seems more appropriate. But there was this one show, and I won't name it, but on one skit, there's a couple about to get married. And they're with the in-laws, both in-laws. So six of them at the table at a restaurant, a very nice restaurant. And they're all ordering the most expensive foods on the menu. And the groom turns to his mom. And he says, he needs busy. If you don't know British don't worry about it. And at first I didn't quite understand what, it, what he was asking for. And um, she begins to breastfeed her son. And I'm just like, okay. It was really bizarre and really crass. And, but 
That imagery came to mind as I'm thinking about the writer of Hebrews who says, some of you, some of us need to stop drinking milk and we need to move on to meat. Some of us are still being breastfed and yet we will probably claim to be believers for decades. And the point being, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's why you lack assurance. Because now you're getting the big boy, big girl problems and circumstances. You're trying to deal with it and impress them. So I look at my younger son, and he's a late boomer, so he looks like he's got like an elementary kid's body. My older son, he's been this height, pretty much this size since sixth grade. I've been this high since it's great. And it was funny looking over graduation pictures because uh, now all his friends are about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and they just kind of do this to them. <laughs> Before, Ben used to do this to them. But it just kind of, you know, he stayed the same in every class picture. And they slowly and certainly would fall And it would be sad to look at him and to think that he hasn't developed. When you have small... Um, resources, if you have that immature frame that hasn't quite matured and developed, you can't do the things adults do. You just can't. So Ben lives like a man. You know? He lives like a little boy. He's like, Dad, look, 25 pounds. <laughs> That's 25 pounds. And Ben's like, 225. You know, this is a little different. And, Ben's not 200 pounds heavier than you are. When I find myself overwhelmed by life circumstances, my first instinct is to blame God. That's not that. Because I know and I believe that God is perfect and He's been faithful. And then I then look at myself and hopefully I find that I have not trusted Him. Or that in this particular area, my muscles are not mature. And I fought. We need to see that God has placed so much before us to digest. It's like going to, remember my, my sister in law lives in New York City. She's kind to treat us when we go visit her. And there's this great steakhouse. There's so many in the United States, probably. Um, one place called Wolfgang's. Great meat. And imagine if you went to these meats that you've never seen before and tasted. And all you want is a mac and cheese. I don't know if the way we will serve you. You get really disappointed uh, when you see how people offer something to someone and they just don't realize what they have or they use it so minimally. Maybe you're like me who has a half decent phone and you don't know how to use it. You just use it for texting. And that's me. I, I don't know how to put collages on Facebook. I'm like yells at me. I'm sure she's talked to me a dozen times. She says, because is an older phone. She says, you don't deserve that. I don't. But and God has given us this great resource of the gospel, priceless, one of a kind, indescribable, so deep, endlessly deep. And we're just crashing surface. And some of us have, and we need the writer of Hebrews to kick us in our butt, and he says, stop drinking and wrestling. I'm sure it tasted good when I was one. I actually tried it when I was 28. I just wanted to know what my son was eating. So come on, I bet if some of you men, you're, you're interested or you're dumb enough like me to try it. It did not taste good. I'm sorry, but um, it would just be really weird. You came into my fridge, you saw these baby bottles and said, oh, what was this for? That's mine. Take it every day. No, I'm really sorry. Stop drinking the rest of it. Eat the meat of the gospel. And then you get to where it says, and you go back.
back to verse 19. Now we can have confidence. Do you have confidence knowing that I've had a bad week? This morning I came to the realization that I had taken so much of my son's life to my credit. Not God. That once he, as the process was going through him getting into the Naval Academy, got in, I was done praying. I had done it. And now that moment when I didn't know I was about to stop praying, I thanked the Lord for doing everything. But then all of a sudden, the lack of prayer to see that they, this is everything, this is you, you did this. When people say, oh, you raised a great child, that's right, I did it. I did it. Confidence was in me, not in the Lord. I was reminded of how much he had done. And when you come in here, is your confidence in the Lord, or is it that you have done so much to come in here? Or maybe you're hesitant to come in here, or you actually make your way here, you, you pull yourself together to come out on a Sunday, but your heart is a little hesitant to be given to the Lord because you've had that week and you haven't had your quiet time in a couple of months or years. I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't do your quiet time. But it's saying that if you have been washed by the blood of Jesus, you have every bit of confidence, as anybody should, who's in the Lord, to come before God. Now, I look back on, as his father's day, I look back and I remember those times when my dad would scold me and I would think, my dad doesn't love me. That's me. I'm my dad. But now I know, as a parent, and I hope my kids don't feel this way, or I hope my kids know this, that when I scold them or reprimand them, that I'm not saying, look, I'm going to pause my love for you until you get this right. Or we're going to kind of add a little clause to this parental child relationship, and you'll continue to receive my love and get even more of it if you study harder, if you clean your bed, if you do this or that, or if you stop using these words, whatever it may be. That's me. And we may be doing that when we come before the Lord. And that's a failure on our part to understand that what we have received in Jesus is permanent. It cannot be taken away. Elsewhere in Scripture it says, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hands. Now the writer of Hebrews is going to resound this word. you got to make sure you are actually in His hands. But that's another sermon. We have full confidence. Verse 25, the new and living way that he opened for us through that curtain. He opened that curtain. Remember when Jesus died and the curtain tore from the top to the bottom. Allowing us now to enter into what was called in the Old Testament, the most holy place. And here's the great thing. In the Old Testament, you were never allowed to enter that place. And a priest, once a year, was allowed to enter for you. And that person could even go whenever he wanted to. But now wherever you are, you are in the most holy place of God. There is never a distance that grows. If there's any distance that you feel that widens between you and the Lord, it's in your mind. Or again, the writer of Hebrews would throw out this option. Or maybe you are always distant and never close. So we have all verse 21. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. How do you draw near to something to someone who you don't feel wants to be with you? We don't even want to see those people. There's that phrase, hate the face. Or I don't want to even see you. I think my I'm sure my parents use that Korean phrase that's properly translated. Um, I hate your face. Right? Is, is that the best translation? Or I hate seeing your face. I don't think she meant that literally. I think she just meant I'm really angry right now. But God always welcomes, like the father to the prodigal son. <laughs> Remember, the prodigal son was the one that convinced himself, I am lesser than my father's servant. That's the son that does that, not the father. And he needed to be reminded, you are my son. That has never changed. When you took the inheritance, you were still my son. 
When you squandered it with prostitutes, you were still my son. When you came back and ate the paws from the pigs, you were still my son. When you came back groveling and asking me for a place in my house, you're still my son. Always my son. Always my son. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance with our hearts sprinkled clean. What the writer of Hebrews is not telling us is this. He is not saying, okay, now that you've been forgiven once for all, don't worry about the little sins that you do. Here's the irony of it. Now that I know God has forgiven me once for all, I can go to Him with greater confidence when I do falter individually in those episodes. Because I know He's going to forgive me. I know it's not like some marriage relationships where that's it, I've had enough, I can't do it. There is no that straw that breaks the camel's back. That never comes. It's not there. And God continuously welcomes us. And so, as a result of that, I close with this. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession. The truth of the gospel. Hold on. Yeah, we're Presbyterian Reformed here. Yes, God is sovereign. We emphasize that a lot. But the gospel message also emphasizes you got to take hold of the faith too. You ever see that awkward hug? Some of the hugs and the others just kind of like that. Barely touching with the fingertips. <coughs> it's really weird. Take hold of the one who's helping you. Or like a parent who's holding so tightly to their child, their child doesn't convert it because they just want to be let go. Don't do that. Hold on to the one who embraces you. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another, loving the deeds. Why? Because through those deeds, through that love I consider, I experience His grace and His mercy. I am reminded of the service of Christ. I am reminded that God is worthy of my life my sacrifices, all my talents and gifts. Verse 25, not neglected to be together. Because even when I meet with believers who are warped or immature, even when I meet with believers who may not look like me, who may be a completely, gender, a completely different gender from me, who may be even four years older than me, that is a blessing. Kind of like and I know this is a little bit, a good family. Not the bad Thanksgiving meals where, yeah, that might have come. But it's the ones that you long for. Because you know you enjoy the company of even the youngest all the way up to the oldest. Don't stop being young. Don't deceive yourself to think that if you are young, God cannot bless you through someone who is 50 years old. Or vice versa. That may be the hard one. I need to be reminded, even as I'm 47, that someone who is 17 in their faith, 30 years younger, wet behind years, that they can bless me. Not only like meeting together, as, some is, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more <coughs> as you see the more we realize and learn and are reminded of the great gospel that Jesus has given us, our eyes will turn. It's a natural consequence. If you're not eager and say, Maranatha, come Lord quickly, eager for the coming of the Lord and for heaven to come, for Jesus to return and to take us home to that place that he prepares for us is because we have been forgetting. Or we put our spiritual growth on all. Or we've allowed for the lies and the deceits of the world to kind of take a stronger, bigger place in our hearts and minds. And all of us are susceptible. And this is a strong, yet very gentle, loving warning to us. Don't underestimate what the world can do to you. But you can never overestimate. God's grace, the gospel can do it. Increases affection, builds bondage, and gives glory.